Now today is Easter Sunday, and I just got one point, and I'm going to make that point, that, that there is no greater love than God's love. There just isn't. Like, this is, this is, I mean, I'm not talking about love between, you know, a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old. I'm talking about the good stuff, um, you know, the love that, that God gives to us. Now, let's just make an assumption that I don't want this to happen. It's not going to happen, but uh, let's just assume, like, there was some type of earthquake or explosion, um, and it, like, affected, like, you know, the half of the room that you're in. Now, what I would really hope, like, let's do this, like, like, Trey, I would really hope that, like, you know, if something happened, I would, like, I would, I would walk through the fires, and I would go through the rubble, and, um, you know, I'd breathe as much smoke because I would need to breathe to save you, and, you know, Bev and Jeff, I've known you guys for nine years, and I would hope that, you know, if you weren't able to get out by yourself, I would hope that God would give me the, the courage and the strength to do that. And, uh, Natalie, I see you back there. I've known you for a while, and I hope that, uh, you know, after I got them, I could come and get you. And the reason I want to do this is not to be a hero, um, but because these are people I know. These are, uh, these are people that I love. And I believe, and I believe that you believe as well, that uh, we are all children of God and we matter. And because you matter to God, you should matter to everybody. Um, you know, that's the way that this works. Now, to this morning, at this service specifically, like, there's a little bit of an issue here. Um, you know, I have uh, two kids that are at this service. Um, yeah, I know their voice. I've, I've heard their cries. And I'm just being honest with you. Um, I think I would probably go save uh, this little guy, David, before anybody else because I love him that much. And if you're a parent, I think you understand probably what I'm getting at. And then I'll, like, get Benjamin, and I'll say, hey, I'll save you if you don't argue with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll drag him out of the fire. <laughs> now, seriously, I would, I would walk through the fires of hell. I would breathe as much smoke as humanly possible. I would, I would lift up more than I ever thought I could lift up to save those two kids. Now, what's really interesting about this is, like, this is not the way that God did things. You know, if this would have happened in God's economy, the way that it worked, it would have worked like this. Like, God goes and, and, and uh, you know, he saves Justin, and then God goes and he saves Sarah, and then God goes and uh, he, he saves uh, Bill, and then he saves everybody else. Like, everybody in the room, God has went and saved. But then there's one person who's left, and that's his son. You know, he knows the voice. Like, he's heard the cry, he's been there, he's done that. And he goes in and, and he, he attempts to save Jesus, the last person that's in the room. And as, uh, as he's making his way to Jesus, like, he hears Jesus, like, say these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then right before he gets to Jesus, uh, it was the last breath that Jesus breathed, and he said, uh, it is finished. And then he died. You see, what God did is he saved everybody except his son. Now, that's the way that it works out in the Bible, you know. Like Jesus is up on a cross, um, they're watching him die, the people who love him the most, the people who killed him, they're all watching him die. And Jesus says those exact words that I said just a little bit ago. In this place of uh, loneliness, uh, he, he cries out, he doesn't even use the word dad, he doesn't even use the word father, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then a few minutes later, Jesus just couldn't do it anymore. And he looked up to heaven, and he said, it, it, it is finished. And then he breathed his final breath. Now, the gospel, in its simplest and most basic element, is a story of love. It is God's love for humanity. Now, the night before Jesus' uh, death, I mean, just think about this. He's with the people who matter the most to him. He's got one last chance to teach these men what they need to know. So he cuts out the small stuff and he just says the important stuff. And in John chapter 15, verse 13, he gives us one of the most prolific pieces of scripture that we're ever going to read when Jesus says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
Isn't that crazy stuff? There's no greater love than to give one's life for one's friends. And I want you to know that this love is not reserved for those of us who have spent way too much time in seminary. This love is not reserved for the people that come here or go to their small group every week. This type of love is not reserved for those who give 10% of their income to God's purposes. This type of love isn't for those people who make good choices most of the time. This love is for everybody, and everybody means everybody. You know, th this love is for the sinner and the saint. It is for the healthy and the sick. It is for the, the failures and the faithful. It is for the young and the old. Now, in Copenhagen, Denmark, there's a series of... Uh, five, I'm sorry, six paintings uh, in the cathedral downtown, and it's these beautiful paintings, and they tell the story between a, a little boy and a priest. In the first painting is this little boy asking a priest, uh, how is it, Father, that you know that uh, God loves me? And then the next painting, the priest extended his arms, and he says, God loves you uh, this much. But that wasn't good enough for the little boy. It just wasn't. So the little boy looked up at the priest and he says, I know that people always tell me that God loves me this much, but I want to know how you know that he loves me this much. And the priest, he, he thought about it for a second, and then in the final painting, uh, he gives his reply. He said that once Jesus told us that he loved us this much, he died for us. There is no greater love than the one who gives his life for his friends. Now, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Now, listen to what it says. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. So, so here's the deal. Like God is love. Love is God. Who God is, and this is true for us as well, who God is shapes what God does. Now, we are created in God's image, Therefore, we are love, and at our best, then love lives in us. Therefore, we, we have this need. We have this need to love other people and to be loved by other people. We have this need to be loved by God and to love God. Now, this morning, what I want to invite us to do is to know that there is no greater love. You know, if we can leave here this morning knowing that there is no greater love, than the one who has given his life for us. That is a huge win for the kingdom of God here in Omaha. Now, the symbol of love um, here in the United States, it's a heart. You know, the nice little red heart, it's kind of fun shaped. By far the better symbol for love is a cross. Um, the cross is the most widely recognized symbol in the world. It marks more graves, it, it graces more jewelry, it sits atop uh, more buildings than any and all other symbols. Now, it's a very strange symbol. Like, this was a, a symbol of humiliation. It was a, a symbol of threat in the Roman Empire. It was by far the cruelest way for a criminal to be put to death. But Jesus, he changed all that in a moment. The symbol uh, of uh, the power of the, of the human empire was now a symbol of the suffering of the love of God. The ultimate threat now becomes the ultimate expression of hope. And the cross teaches us, and the cross shows us that there is nothing greater than the power of God's love and the power of God's love that is in us. Now, just like Jesus changed the cross forever, Jesus will change those of us who believe in the power of the cross. Now, this begins for most of us with this 18-inch journey from our head to our heart. The problem for some of us, it's not 18 inches, it's uh, 18 miles. And there is a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Now, um, knowing about God is information, and information does not necessarily change us. Uh, knowing God is, is transformational, and it creates this environment um, for a lifetime of growth and, and development. So I want to show you a picture. Um, this is a picture of my dog. Uh, this is Esther. Now, this is back when Esther was like this little puppy. Um, so Esther, if you uh, uh, know the dog, she's, she's a Newf. Uh, she's in Newfoundland. Uh, today, she's uh, two years old. She um, weighs 155 pounds. Um, the Newf is bred to be a water rescue dog. Um, you know, she's got these webbed feet and these huge lungs, and 
and watching her swim is like this amazing thing. And um, Esther also had, I mean, Newfoundlands, uh, of all the dog breeds are out there, um, they had the, the best temperament of any dog. They're also the worst watch dog of any dog. So if you all want to break into our house, just uh, come with a hamburger and you're good to go. Um, now, right now, you know about uh, Esther, don't you? Um, you know a little bit about her, but um, you don't know her. Like, you've never sat on our couch before reading a book and had this great big 155-pound animal sit on you and lick your face. You've never had that done before. Um, you've never uh, started a bathtub and went downstairs to get a snack only to find your dog in the bathtub ready for you to turn on the Whirlpool jets. Um, you've, never, you've never, like, swam with this dog or seen her swim across Lake Sarinsky. I mean, it is this amazing thing. And she makes Michael Phelps look like a turtle. Um, you know, you've never like gone and got a paper towel from the counter, um, only to come back and find that your entire cheeseburger was now in her stomach, and she wants more. You've never let her outside at 10:30 at night, um, thinking that she was just going to go to the bathroom when there was a jogger, and she found the jogger a lot more interesting than going to the bathroom. And you've never chased this uh, dog down and. Uh, boxer shorts and a t-shirt, barefoot in 20 degree weather. You just haven't done that. So you can actually see that there is a difference between knowing about and there is a difference in knowing. Now, now here's where this happens, all right? Um, knowing about is going to give us enough knowledge to skim the surface of life. Knowing is going to take us into the depths of this once-to-be-lived and never-to-be-repeated life that God gives us. Now, Paul, he experienced this. Um, now, I'm just going to read it from... Uh, now, here's, a, here's a guy who had a resurrection. I was thinking this week, like, who is someone who experienced resurrection in the Bible? And Paul is the first person that I thought of. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, we hear the first uh, part of his story. Paul says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. This means that he was pure. Um, I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a, a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I, would, I, I, I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without a fault. Now, at this point in Paul's life, he knew about Jesus. Or he, he knew about God. He didn't know about Jesus. He knew about God. Like, he knew that God, his, his, his upbringing would have demanded that. Like, he was from uh, Israel. He was from the best of the best tribes. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, you were somebody if you were from the tribe of Benjamin. And not only was he from the tribe of Benjamin, but, but he, was, uh, he was a Pharisee, which meant that he would have been a leader. It's kind of like combining a pastor and a professor and an attorney all together. So he would have been the best of the best of the best and the best. Now, he would have had power, he would have had control, he would have had influence, he would have had money, but, but Paul says, like, you know, this stuff just didn't matter because there was something that was missing. Now, listen to what he writes about his resurrection. I once thought that all these things, the power, the prestige, the, the family, the control, the, all, all these things, I, I, I thought that all these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared to the infinite, everything. Everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then this is almost like a prayer. Like he's praying this to the Philippians when he's writing it to them. He says, I want to know Christ. Now here's, here's someone who already knew Christ, but he's saying, I want to know Christ and experience the power that raised him from the dead so that one day or another I will experience resurrection from the dead. All right, so is there anyone here today um, that needs resurrection? You know, Paul needed it. He went from this uh, persecutor of Christians, this self-righteous man, this man who was so bitter inside, he went from that person to the most quoted and the most read author in the history of humanity. He went from that person to a, a planter of, of dozens of churches and, 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 and the planter of really the church that would change the world. So are you looking for that type of resurrection? See, I think you are. I know that I am. You know, maybe it's uh, 
resurrection of hope. Maybe it's like resurrection of a dream. Maybe it's resurrection of, of, of your mind. Maybe it's resurrection of a relationship. Maybe you've made a mistake and you need resurrection from your past. Yeah, I, I think that many of us come here today seeking a resurrection in our spiritual life that we just know that there's a little bit more to life than what we're currently experiencing. And we, we just want to experience, we want to know that there is no greater love than the one who gives his life for his friends. Now, how does this happen? Well, it, it's a process. Like, you're not going to leave here today full of it. You, you're going to leave today with the tools to take the next steps. Now, the first thing that we have to know to know that there is no greater love is to know that love is a gift from God. We can't earn it, we, uh, we can't create it, we don't deserve it, it's a gift. It, it's something that he gives to us. Now, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul, is the, he's the author of this one, um, Paul talks about, like, there's all these things that God gives us. There's, uh, there's uh, healing, and there's prophecy, and there's teaching, and there's leadership, and there's administration, there's speaking in these really cool unknown languages, and he talks about all that stuff, but then he says in, verse, uh, in chapter 13, but I'm going to tell you of a more excellent way. And then he gives the best description for what love is. And he concludes that chapter uh, 13. He says um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, these uh, three things will last forever. Like, these are the best. These are the best of the best right here. Faith, hope, and love. And then it concludes, and the greatest of these is love. It can't be earned. It's not deserved. It can only be accepted. Love is who God is. Love is what God does. And love is what God is wanting to give to all of us. It's kind of like this. Um, This is a story about uh, a computer that I used to own. And uh, a certain eight-year-old in this congregation that I'm not going to mention by name. um, He was like probably four or five at the time. And this computer used to sit on our uh, counter in our kitchen. And one day I went to use this computer and it was, didn't work for some reason, so I plugged it in, I tried to start it, didn't work. Um, shut it, tried to start it the next day, didn't work. Took it to the Apple store, went to the Genius Bar, waited in line for like 45 minutes. Um, the guy looked at it and um, he says, you know, there's like some kind of like mysterious lemon-lime fluid like underneath the keyboard, right? I said, no, I wasn't aware of that little fact. Um, is this fixable? And he says, yeah, it's fixable, but it's going to cost like $800. And you know, we can't even guarantee that it's going to work. Um, I said, well, how much is the new computer? And he says, well, the new computer is like $1,200. So $1,200 later, I got this shiny new uh, silver computer with the Apple logo on there. So I go home, and um, I ask the youngster about this computer. And he's excited. Well, we got a new computer. I said, did you spill some juice on the old computer? Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Um, When I looked at him, do you think I loved him any less? No, I didn't love him any less. I loved him the same because he's my son. There's nothing that he could do that is going to make me love him any less. And I want to speak to anybody who has spilled juice on a computer or something similar. There is nothing that you've done There's nothing that you can do that is going to make the Father's love, who's a whole lot more perfect than anything I could ever give, love you any less. What God does is he faithfully and he continually gives. I want to tell you the story um, about this uh, guy in the Bible. We don't know his name, um, although he's probably one of the most famous people in the Bible. We call him the prodigal son. And he went up to his dad one day, and the dad was a very wealthy man. Jesus is telling this parable. He says, Dad... uh, I know you're not dead yet, but I would like to get my uh, half of your estate now so I can enjoy it while I'm still young. Now, if you're a parent, like, how would you feel about that? Like your kid coming up for like half your estate, even though you're still alive. Basically, what he's saying is like, Dad, uh, you're a pretty cool guy, but I love your stuff a whole lot more than I love you. Um, Can I have it now? Now, this dad's a whole lot more generous than I am. Um, The dad gives him the stuff. you know, the kid goes out and he just he blows it all. Um, you know, he spends it, he wastes it. Uh, you know, who knows what he spent it on. So this kid, like he he's in desperate place now. He, he's lost. He's lonely. He's broken. He's uh, broke. He's hurting. He's humiliated. And 
he ran out of options. You know, basically, the Bible says that he was trying to eat the food that he was feeding the pigs that he was working on as a laborer. He thought to himself, you know, I got a dad, and he's a good man. I'm going to go back to him and at least see what he says. Then we find probably one of the coolest verses in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 15, verse 20. Now listen to what Jesus says here. So he returned home to his father. Now, I'm going to stop for a second, all right? For anyone that's ever spilled the juice on the computer, for anyone who's ever loved God's creation more than God, this is for you. This is for me. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, this is what God is like when we go to God. Jesus starts this parable by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He, he didn't wait. This is so cool. Like, it's like, okay, son, come up and say you're sorry. And then we'll, No, he ran to his son. And listen to what happened next. He, he, he embraced him and he kissed him. And later they said that there's laughter in heaven because the son of mine who once was lost is, is, is now found. And, and for all the prodigals, all the people who have spilled juice in the computer are, are something similar. All the people who have loved God's creation more than God. He invites us to return home where we will be embraced, where we will be accepted, and where we will be loved. So that's the first part of the journey is just to know that this is a gift. It's something that God gives to us. The second part is that the loved person then becomes the loving Okay, if you're loved for long enough, you become loving. Now, I want you to hear this. Like, I want you to hear this. Like, God accepts you where you are. You know, you, you've come to this place this morning, and I can guarantee you that God accepts you where you are. Now, God loves you so much that God is not going to leave you where you are. So what happens here, then, is that the, the, uh, the recipient of grace becomes the giver of grace, that the, that the forgiven becomes the forgiving and the love becomes the loving. Now, here's what it says in the Bible, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love each other because he loved us first. Basically, the love becomes the loving. Now, the single best way to know that there is no greater love is to practice it. You know, if you want to know something, you, you do it. Here's what I wrote about love um, earlier this week. I'm just going to read it. I, I just I was thinking, about how, how is it we love somebody? It's like this. You can actually look somebody in the eye and say something like this. I am energized by your hopes and dreams and all the possibilities in front of you. I want you to know that I will do whatever I can do to help you become what God wants you to become and help you achieve what God wants you to achieve. I will always point you to God. I will be in your corner. And I hope that you will join me as well so that I can discover, embrace, fulfill God's purposes and God's plans for me. And I'm just going to let you do a little bit of dreaming, okay? Like when our life becomes full of this type of love, this type of love that we're created to live out, like here's what our life looks like. All of a sudden we're patient because other people's imperfections, they just don't matter as much. You know, it's going to be a life that's absent of, of jealousy or envy because we really want what's best for the other person. It's a life where we get to forgive and live and not remember and resent. You know, the bitterness and the brokenness, it, it disappears. And it's a life where we don't give up on other people because God doesn't give up on us. Now, the third thing I want us to look at is that uh, love is a duty. It's a duty. Now, when I say the word duty... Um, you guys aren't really excited about this one, are you? Duties are generally something that uh, we have to do that we don't want to do. But you know what? Jesus did this. Like, this is how he lived. Jesus had a duty to uh, fulfill the Old Testament prophecies, and he did it. Jesus had a, a, a duty to suffer so that we may thrive. Jesus had a duty to die so that we may live. Now, think about this word duty. Like, it just doesn't excite, but listen to what Jesus says. Like, in John chapter 13, verse 34, this is right after he talks about uh, you know, giving his life for his friends. Um, he says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Now you can almost replace that word commandment with duty. He says, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. 
you love it. It's like a commandment. It's a duty. Now, I had the two kids, and um, guess what? They have duties. They have some duties. Like, one of the duties is, like, to, to clean the house. Um, one of the duties is to do their homework. One of the duties is not to play on Harrison Street because we don't want them to get run over by cars. Like, these are some of the duties that we have for our kids. Now, why is it, do you think we give these kids duties? Is it because, like, we're lazy and we don't want to do the work? Is it because we want to keep them busy and uh, out of trouble? Um, no, absolutely not. The reason that we give them duties is because we love them and we want what's best for them. Now, the command of Jesus is very simple. He says, love, love God, love neighbor, and love self. Now, here's a prayer I've been praying this week. Um, I just want to encourage you to maybe consider praying this as well. And it's just a simple three-sentence prayer. Lord, may I love and be loved by you. May I love myself for who I am and not who others want me to be. And may I love others for who they are and not who I want them to be. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is that uh, love is blind. You know, here in our culture today in the United States in 2015, love is not blind. What I'm going to teach you is 180 degrees different than what culture teaches us. You go to a movie, you watch a television show, you look around at your friends, and, and love is not blind. Love has 20-20 vision. Love keeps meticulous score. People know who is worthy and people know who is unworthy, but Christian doctrine, on the contrary, um, is to love all people, even the enemy, not to make exceptions, neither of preference nor aversion. So Jesus says, uh, pray for your enemies. Pray for those uh, who persecute you. Now here is where the gospel gets challenging. I mean, if you can pull this one off, love is blind, then you figure life out. So it was on April 9th of uh, 1940. Um, it was the day that Germany uh, invaded Norway. Uh, 400,000 uh, troops came into this tiny populated country of just three million people. The Norwegians didn't even bother to put up a fight. Tens of thousands of people were murdered. Tens of thousands of people were put into concentration camps. Uh, there was thousands of German babies that were born. The nation was covered with, uh, with minefields. The economy was destroyed. The hearts of the people were broken. They discovered what it was like to live on hell on earth for five years. But five years, one month, and one day later, on, April, uh, on May 9th of uh, 1945, the Allies were declared the winners of the war. And this great big party broke out amongst the people because they were now free. They were captives before, and now they are free. And there was a family um, that had this great big party. In 1992 in Stavanger, I got to spend the summer with my uh, Uncle Bertel. And he was the one that told me the story. It was uh, our family. And there was like 20, 25 people there. They had the salmon, they had the lamb, they had the rutabaga, the turnips, whatever else they could find. Um, and uh, the, the meal was cooked, and his grandma, who would be like my great-great-aunt, um, looked at Bertel. He was probably about a 20-year-old kid at the time. And there's these four Germans who were waiting in a park a couple hundred yards down the road to be picked up and transported back to Germany. And you know what she said to Uncle Bertel? She said, go get the Germans. And he said, Why? She said, because they're hungry. Now, some of you think that this story is really radical. Some of you think that this is so far out there that we just don't understand it. But you know what? You know what? I'm so glad that love is blind. Because I look at everything I've done. I've looked at everything I didn't do. And I'm glad that God looks at me and says that love is blind. And you know, it is God tells us to love other people. He's basically just saying, love other people the same way that I love other people. And, and we close with this. I, I want to invite you to know that there is no greater love than the one who has given his life for us. You know, God is giving us a gift. Accept it. It's free. It doesn't cost you a darn thing. You know, to, 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 to be loved, then what happens is we become the loving, and, and we do this faithfully, and we do it to whoever, whenever, wherever. And I guarantee I guarantee that once this type of love comes into our lives, 
And once we become restored into God's image of love, that we will experience a resurrection like we have never experienced a resurrection before. So let's pray.